effect on the quality of life for uh, for all kinds of people. And then, of course, the, it's going to affect agriculture as well and our ability to uh, to feed all the people in the world and uh, and <clears throat> change the the availability of fresh water. And it's it there are just so many things that um, unforeseeables that um, will have a negative effect on the quality of life that uh, you, you really don't want to think about them. But Paul, if we if, don't do if, something, we're going to have to think about them. What if the ET presence is not benevolent? What if it's not there in a kind gesture, but it's really there, you know, these abductions are happening, mutilations are happening, that they've got a different motive, and we can't stop them. Is that possible? Well, it's, it, what you see is we, we can't stop them. We couldn't have stopped them. They had the upper hand for a long time. And they could have taken us over any time they wanted, which is, uh, I think, evidence that they didn't want to. And, you know, they were, they were not uh, malevolent, that they were, in fact, benevolent. And I've only heard one or two rare instances of, uh, of suspicion about their malevolence. One, in alleged briefings to presidents, that the presidents have been told that, uh, for the most part, more, the majority of the species are benevolent. And nothing to worry about, but there is one that is that is not. And uh, then uh, I think uh, one British book that I read, there were some indication that they had uh, been a little rough. But in, I t- sort of checked those examples, and I found that every one of them could have been that we shot first, as it were, and that. Uh, any retaliation was uh, was in self defense or uh, in many cases and if I can revert to Wilbert Smith now fifty years ago, he raised this question with the ETs and they said, Well, most of it is due to the stupidity of your pilots <laughs> and uh, the, the, he was told that they were going to take uh, uh, maneuvers to try and avoid getting close enough to them you know to have any problem. And also there was a question of, of the, the electronic fields, the magnetic fields of the, of the craft uh, having a, an effect on, uh, on the molecular uh, uh, makeup of, of metal. And so if they got too close to one of our planes that the, the molecular uh, makeup could change and that the, the metal could just disintegrate. So th- there have been cases where... Probably the what appeared to be like hostility was was not, and as far as the the briefings are concerned, I think the the reason I want to see full disclosure, I would like to see the people who say there is one malevolent uh, to say under oath who it is and what their evidence is, so that we'll know that they're telling the truth and not just erecting another. A bogeyman as an excuse for uh, uh, spending hundreds of billions of dollars more to uh, weaponize space. Did did anybody ever come to you and um, admit that there is a uh, some kind of a problem with the ET presence or anything like that? Anything no, to, not nothing to be frightened. No, the, the, you know the Charles Hall story, for example, I I found interesting because it showed how frightened we can be of them, and he says, and them of us, um, with the species that he was dealing with, that um, his his colleagues, uh, the uh, weathermen acting out in the desert, were just petrified by by these, uh, I don't like to use the word creature, the, these people who could uh, fly along the, the ground at uh, great speeds and who wore... Uh, protective uh, clothing that uh, and carried uh, carried you know unusual weapons and so on and he he managed to establish a relationship with them under which there was you know mutual trust and uh, and from reading his book i would say that he he just believes that it's uh, it takes two to tango and if we if we trust them and uh, and cooperate with them, they will trust us and cooperate with us. 
But if it's like anything else in the world, you know, hate breeds hate and love breeds love. And if we put our best foot forward, why uh, we'll be able to move forward together. But if we uh, if we get tough and start uh, as, as we probably have been doing, uh, doing too much shooting, why we always run the risk that somebody's going to shoot back. Tell me about your 10-year concern, this available window, even though it may be a little longer, but tell me about that. Um, I think the 10 years, I think, is a very optimistic forecast. <clears throat> the best scientist I've read on this subject is uh, Dr. Hansen, a NASA scientist, who's written a book, um, I think his name is James Hansen, who's written a book called The Floods of My Grandchildren. And he, I think, thinks that we're right on the cusp now, that it, it, we're getting to the point where it may be almost too late as of now. Being a, an eternal optimist, I'm giving us 10 years. Uh, but uh, that, that's sort of stretching it. And, uh, and if you compare it with the 20, 30, or 40 years, that most of the 50 years that the politicians are talking about, you can see that... Uh, it's a, it's a desperate situation, and I think if we did turn it around 10 years, we could probably save the situation, or largely so. But it's going to have to be real fast, it's going to have to be real efficient, and it's going to be very expensive, it's going to cost trillions of dollars, and that means changing the banking system and uh, getting on with the job, and uh, as I say, now, not later. Well, i got to tell you, Paul, you've done a great job with light at the end of the tunnel, and tell me, where can people pick up this book? I think it, it may be available in Barnes and Noble. It's certainly available in Maz, on Amazon, or can be. It can be uh, uh, bought directly from uh, Author House uh, USA, or I have a website. Um, I don't suggest you go there for uh, to, to buy it, but maybe for other reasons. It's uh, Paul Heather uh, Web, all one word. Paul Heather Web dot com, and if you want uh, more information on what I'm doing in the uh, the various fields that we've discussed by we'll try and post a little bit from time to time for you to take a look at. Paul, we'll take questions with you next hour. It'll be the final hour we've got with you. If if you were in office today as a defense minister and the, the Iraq-Afghanistan situation was hitting its peak again, weapons of mass destruction, what would you have recommended to your prime minister? In well, I would have recommended no wars. I think when the accounting is done for the last three wars that the U.S. have been involved in, Vietnam, Iraq, and uh, Afghanistan, when you finally do a, a cost-benefit accounting, that you will come to the conclusion that uh, each one of them was, uh, was ill-advised. And uh, <clears throat> there are other ways of solving the world's problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. And uh, the cost of the, the American people, both in money and in lives, has been horrendous. Do you believe there was another motive behind all this? Um, I, I hesitate to say, to, to say, because speculation and rumors are are things that uh, I think can be damaging. Damaging, and uh, I, I really would prefer not to say. But I, I well, I know there there were geopolitical uh, considerations. I think that much is is uh, self evident. But uh, I don't think that they should be over. And, and, and you know, the, again, it comes back to oil, in one case at least, and maybe in the other to a certain extent. And uh, that there are other ways to solve the problems, and we've been talking about them. Tell me what you enjoyed about this book more than anything. What I enjoyed about it? Yes. Getting it finished. Aha. <laughs> it took a long time, and I, by the time I got finished, I was the... Uh, Fed up to the teeth, as the saying goes, and then it took a long time to get uh, get it in circulation. It's and not easy. No, it's not easy. It's a it's a big job, and uh, I'm glad it's behind me. Well, good good for you, Paul. The uh, Robert Lazar, another one who claims that there's uh, withheld stolen ET technology as well. Eventually. Are we going to get any more whistleblowers, those that come forward, maybe not with their names? Like you said, they could be afraid of their jobs. They could be put in jail, perhaps. But are we going to get more and more whistleblowers out there? I think the answer is yes. I think it's increasing all the time. 
from uh, people I've talked to, including Paul Harris, uh, for example. Uh, people are coming forward who uh, who have been very reluctant before, and and some of them I think are maybe paving the way. One of the people that she uh, interviewed, as you know, Monsignor Balducci, not speaking for the Vatican, but um, along with other spokesmen from the Vatican, I'm sort of preparing people for something new and different, some new ideas, and uh, saying, hey, the the cosmos is a great, wonderful place, and we should raise our eyes and uh, and understand that there's something uh, out there that uh, we should be aware of. All right, Paul, we're going to come right back. Lots of phone calls for you, the ET presence, your take on the economy, and... Uh... Also, uh, alternative energy. Back in a moment with phone calls with Paul Hillier on Coast to Coast AM. 